So welcome to the PTL webinar series. These series uh, evolved from sessions that were held by the PTLs regarding updates to their projects at each summit. Uh, we've converted those talks into webinars to extend the reach of the events beyond this uh, summit. And today our PTLs that are going to present will be John Griffith with Block Storage and Owen Glynn with Telemetry. So if you have questions, you can ask them in the chat box in the lower left-hand corner, um, and we can answer them between sessions or at the end. I'm Margie Calworth Foundation. I'm joined here today with Allison Price. And from there, we will get going. So John, I'm going to put this into present mode, and then you can take it from there. All right, great. Thanks, Margie. Sure. Um, so I am the uh, current PTO for the Block Storage Project for Cinder. Um, and today I just put together some slides here to go through and talk a little bit about um, mostly focusing on where we're going for Juno and, and kind of what our plans are there. Um, and then, you know, a little bit, touch on a little bit what we did for Icehouse, but that's, that's old news right now, right? So we're all, we're all moving on. So um, anyway, let's go ahead. Um, I'm kind of big on themes uh, for release cycles. So this one I ripped off an old Kinks album. Uh, hopefully none of you remember this, but <laughs> anyway, the theme for Juno is try and give the people what they want. Um, so if we go to the next slide, what that means is based on feedback that myself and some of the others on the Cinder core team have re received from enterprise users and private cloud deployers, we wanted to take as much of that information as we could and figure out um, what we can do in Cinder to make um, OpenStack more feasible and more attractive for them uh, and make it more appealing for them. Um, the, the trick with that is trying to actually take feedback from actual users and actual deployers as opposed to um, uh, vendors. You know, in Cinder you have to be careful because it's extremely vendor heavy, which is great. Um, but you have to be careful because their perception of what customers want isn't always what customers actually want. So I tried to distill that as much as I could. Um, and the main things that, that I came up with, uh, you know, in Atlanta after talking with a number of folks was um, continuing to improve the backups that we have, um, focus on the compatibility issues um, in terms of not just back-end devices, um, but also in terms of when you upgrade and go to new versions and things like that, um, which leads into the next one of not breaking upgrades. Um, the resounding theme was just make sure you keep giving me something that works. Um, so that was that was good feedback. So the general feedback is it works as it is. Um, keep doing that. So um, some other interesting things were uh, I need to be able to use my existing gear, um, and then of course quality. And then the one big missing factor was HA. Um, so in the next slides coming up here, I'm going to start touching on some of these individually a little bit. Um, so on the backups topic, uh, of course, you know, when you talk about private and enterprise and things like that, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, one of the most important things that, that people do are backups. Um, Cinder does have a backup service. Um, we, we introduced that a couple of releases ago. It uh, works pretty well. So what we do is we do a backup to object store. Uh, it can be Swift. It can be Ceph to object store. Um, and there is actually a, a tape uh, driver in there now as well that you can use. Um, the problem that we have right now, though, is it's a full backup every time. So there's no concept of real backup management like incrementals and things like that. Um, so that, that's a little bit of a trick there. Um, the other problem is, is it's a little bit difficult to restore that volume. So restoring it in terms of getting the data back and getting it on a volume and stuff, that's not necessarily hard. That's, that's easy to do. Of course, it works. Um, Getting that integrated back into your OpenStack environment, though, um, takes a little bit of a little bit of cajoling sometimes. So, um, so we're we're trying to look at a couple of things to fix that. So one of the the top things is incrementals. So we really need to figure out a way to do incrementals in Juno. Uh, there's a couple of proposals out there that are actually pretty promising that came out of the Atlanta summit. Um, so we're definitely looking at those, and I think we're going to make some progress this, this cycle on that. Um, so hopefully you will see uh, the addition of at least a first iteration of incremental backups uh, supported inside of the Juno release. Um, in addition to that, on the restore side, uh, we've, uh, we've got a manage unmanage uh, feature added now, which allows you to do things like import a volume 
into Cinder that was, you know, somewhere else. That actually ties in really nicely with the backup piece um, because depending on how you did your backups or if you use something outside of the Cinder backup service or something like that, um, you now actually have a method that you can actually pull that volume back in and get it managed again. So, next slide. Um, compatibility. So this is an interesting one because initially I always thought I knew exactly what people meant, right? They were just talking about version of version uh, upgrades like, uh, you know, Havana to Ice House, et cetera. Um, but actually everybody has a different view on this. Uh, some people look at it in terms of the Cinder versioning between the upgrades, uh, but almost as many people look at it in terms of features between different backends. Um, one of the things that I, I learned in talking to a lot of people is very few people actually only use one backend device in Cinder. Or even for those folks that do, uh, they have plans or at least they want the ability to have the flexibility to change to something else uh, later down the road. Uh, so those are things that I think are really important for us to keep in mind um, from the Cinder side and I think we're, we're trying to do that and we're driving towards that. Um, also, it's really interesting to see how many people are actually using the reference implementation, the LVM driver, which is really important to me. Um, it's something that, that I spend a lot of time on and, and I think a lot of other folks do as well in the community. So, um, so the goal here is we want to keep all of the third-party drivers, we want to make sure that they're all compatible in terms of the API functionality and stuff like that by having each of them implement their own CI. Um, and what that means is every patch that goes into OpenStack right now goes through a continuous integration uh, test phase. And what that does is it runs um, an extensive set of functional tests that we have um, to make sure that all the API calls work and everything's compatible and nothing's broken. And, and we call that DSVM full. So the idea is if we can get to a stage where we have every driver that's in Cinder actually run that and run that on every patch ideally, um, then it gives some, some uh, visibility and, and some indication to people that, hey, this driver does actually work. It does implement all the API calls, um, and there is compatibility. Uh, so that's, that's the idea there. Um, so as I said, you know, that ensures that all the core API functions are tested and supported on every driver. Um, it's publicly visible. Um, and then, of course, the other thing is we just keep in mind, don't break things between versions. Um, there's not a whole lot of detail I can go into there, except for it's just something that every reviewer inside of uh, uh, the Cinder project keeps an eye on. Every time a blueprint comes in, we keep an eye on that sort of thing. And we keep, a, we, we keep in mind that, hey, we have to make sure that, A, you can upgrade easily and it's not difficult. And then, B, it doesn't break anything when you do upgrade. Okay. Um, so this is sort of a, a recap on, I dug into details here, but this is just a summary of those details, right? Um, so we can skip past this one. Um, so on the something that works piece, right? I had mentioned that one of the things that, that people have mentioned is give me, keep giving me something that works. Um, so how do you do that? Well, the previous two slides are basically how we do that, right? So we make sure that uh, every backend driver, every piece of code that goes into Cinder actually implements all of the functionality, all of the API calls. So um, the third-party CI testing, that is actually going to be the, the greatest benefit here, and that's going to be something, that's going to be the one thing that gives us the best chance of making sure you have something that works. Um, and then in addition, you know, touching on that, the LVM implementation, the reference driver, that's still the primary focus in Cinder. The primary focus is to continue to make that better, to continue to improve that, and make that something that's usable and, and something that's robust for people to actually implement. So, one of the other pieces of feedback that I've mentioned is, um, you know, people want to use their existing gear. Um, it's, it's really common, it seems, uh, for people, especially in the private sector, that are getting started with OpenStack, to actually look at repurposing gear that they already have. Um, <clears throat> So in that respect, um, you know, we still have a lot of vendor participation. We have a lot of drivers coming in. I think there's probably um, at least another half a dozen or so that are proposed for the Juno release already. And there's, typically there's more to come. Uh, they always show up about halfway through. So 
Um, I, I think there'll probably be, you know, probably eight to ten more drivers added. Um, and I think that's a good thing because that gives people choices. Um, and not only do they have choices in terms of what they use, not only do they have choices in terms of, hey, I already have gear from this particular vendor, I can now use it um, and get started in OpenStack and get going, but also they like the, the ability to mix and match, as I said before. So, um, so these are really important things. Um, and then, you know, the key bullet at the end there, don't lock me in. We hear that all the time in OpenStack. Everybody says they don't want to be locked into a specific solution, right? So. So those are important things, and I think that we're going to keep going down that path. Um, the key bullet point that, that we talk about on the reference implementation um, and that keeps people from either uh, from continuing to use it or using it for all of their deployment or anything like that um, is HA. Um, so if you're familiar with the Cinder reference volume service, um, <clears throat> The way it works is actually you have a single node, so it is a single point of failure. There's no redundancy there or anything else. Uh, it's something that we've known as a shortcoming, and, we, and we've tried different ideas and stuff like that. Um, in Atlanta, we actually had uh, some folks from uh, Linbit come out in, in DRBD and have some solutions, um, and they're willing to, to try and work with us and try and make something uh, that, that gives us that HA solution and gives it to us without sacrificing a bunch of performance. Um, so we've got some stuff in the works with them, and, and I expect to see some really good things in Juno um, and, and finally see this problem go away. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, we also, um, you know, some folks uh, have come up with a, a, uh, a patch that they do on their own in their environment where they actually do some mirroring across multiple cinder volume nodes. Uh, using a software RAID, and my first response was, hey, I tried that, but the performance is really bad, and they said, ah, yes, but you can tune it X, Y, Z. So, um, so we've got some work going there. Uh, so, the, so the good thing is, I think in Juno, not only are we going to have HA for the LVM driver, but I think we're going to have uh, choices in, in which a HA solution you want to choose. So uh, choices are always good as long as they all work, right? So next slide. So, not only uh, are the things that you know people are coming back and what we're hearing in terms of what's important to them, not only is that good feedback and stuff like that, but it's also kind of good to point out what we're not hearing, right? Um, so some of the things that I'm not hearing uh, from from folks is I'm not hearing that there's a bunch of missing features. Um, I'm not hearing that they're missing API calls or things that they want. Um, I'm not hearing that there's too many options or too many choices in backends. Um, and I'm certainly not hearing that, hey, I don't need block storage, so that's good. <laughs> and then, you know, back to the same thing, you're missing X, Y, Z, so I'm not getting a lot of that. So, um, so that's a good thing. Uh, that means that we're focusing on the right things, um, hopefully, and, and, and we're going down the right path. Next. Um, so some of the other things that we're working on, you know, I, I focused on those mostly because those are items that I've received feedback from, from people that are actually implementing. Um, but some of the other things that, that we feel are important that we're working on as a team um, that, are, that are primary focuses. Um, the first one is, is code cleanup and fixes and what I call object sprawl. Um, you know, over time, Cinder has now been out for, for a number of releases and, and we're considered a a mature grown-up project now. Um, there's there's been a lot of, of sprawl and a lot of uh, code mess um, that's that's kind of developed over the years. Um, so there's a there's an effort in Juno to actually go through and clean that up. Um, that has a lot of benefits for an end user, um, mostly because what that means for them is you're going to have something that's actually more robust, uh, easier for us to debug. Uh, find issues, maintain, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a really good thing. It's really important. Nobody likes to do it, but it's really important. Um, the other thing is, is we're working on uh, getting the ability for um, admins to set up replication. Um, we're trying to avoid doing like a full-blown, hey, this is a repl replication setup and everything else, um, and, and make it actually in the API and baked to do everything and anything. Um, but what we want to do is just kind of start by making it easier for an admin to do it. So um, expose some of the features, um, expose some of the things for an admin to actually set that up and make it a little bit easier without having to know everything about the back-end device. Um, 
We're also introducing the concept of consistency groups. So those of you who are familiar with uh, databases and do a lot of database work, um, you know what that's all about. Um, we've actually got some, uh, some code that's actually been written up and prototyped that we were playing with. Um, and we're making good progress there. So we'll see that in Juno for sure. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of folks out there that still have devices that uh, utilize the concept of storage pools. Um, so for those folks, there's some problems with that because what happens with the sender scheduler, the way it works today, um, is it just goes to the back end and it gets everything, uh, all the information globally from that back end device. Um, and it doesn't take into account that some of the pools may be unused or anything like that and do some of the load balancing and stuff. So we're gonna add the uh, concept of storage pools um, so that that can be broken out. It's gonna be invisible to the end user still, of course, um, but what it's gonna do is it's gonna make the scheduler do things more intelligently. Um, so that's a good thing. And then the other thing that's been kicked around for a really long time and I think it's finally gonna happen in Juno um, is uh, scheduling local storage on compute nodes. Um, and, and what that means is there's use cases where people actually want to use local attached storage, uh, local attached disks that they have in their compute node um, as a center volume that they attach to their, their instance. Um, currently, we have no way to, of really doing that um, without actually running a full-blown volume ser center volume service on every compute node, um, which in my opinion is kind of a step backwards from, from where we've been going. So um, we, we've got some ideas. Vish, uh, Ashaya had, a, had some ideas uh, back in Portland um, that we just never actually made happen. Um, but I think we've got, between myself and some other folks that are really interested in, in working on this, there's also a lot of demand. Um, I think in Juno we're actually going to make some progress and, and we'll get this feature out. So look for that. That's going to be something that's really cool. So. Next. So um, in terms of you know, what we're missing, um, things like that. Um, I just wanted to put this slide in here for folks that see it. If, you, if you're deploying a private cloud with OpenStack or you're thinking about it or considering it, you've researched it or anything like that, um, you know, let me know what we're missing. Uh, if there's things that you see, if there's gaps, um, you know, send me an email, grab me on IRC, whatever. Um, but, but let us know, let the sender team know um, what problems you might have um, how we can make it easier and more beneficial and, and make it advantageous for you and, and help you get started with, with using OpenStack. Or, you know, if you're already started or whatever, how we can make it better for you. Um, so we're always open to feedback. We don't get enough, um, in my opinion. I think we can always use more. So, next. Um, you know, and then finally, the other thing that I always tell people is, um, you know, get involved. Um, Contributing to OpenStack is not just for software developers. Um, it's in, in open source uh, is more is about more than just writing code. Uh, so, you know, there's documentation, there's filing bugs, uh, feature requests, and then you know the most important thing is just feedback. Um, just giving feedback to the community to the developers um, is a great way to contribute to OpenStack. That that way we're actually building something that you want. Um, so it's extremely important. Um, and then finally, the other thing is support others. Um, if you've deployed OpenStack and, and got things running and, and have you know, lessons learned and stories to tell and stuff like that, share those stories and help other people uh, that, are, that are starting on this journey as well. So with that, that's all I have. So um, Great. I'm not sure if we want to take questions now or later. I think we can do later. I think we can do it later unless people have something they want to ask right now. Okay, if anyone has any questions for John, you can put it in the chat box. And we can answer them later if you don't have any right now. Okay. I don't see any right now, so thank you so much, John. Yep, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> this is Margie again. Okay, well, I am going to turn it over now to um, Owen Glenn, and Owen, I'm going to put your presentation in presentation mode. So, Owen, are you out there? I am indeed, Parzi, and thank you Great. very much for the intro. Sure, sure. Go right ahead. Cool. So, um, hi, folks. My name is Owen Glenn. As Parzi said, I'm a PTL of the telemetry program at OpenStack. 
And the main constituent project in that program is Salometer, and that's probably the, the code name that you're more familiar with. So one thing I wanted to kind of cover initially was this idea of this kind of persistent identity crisis around Salometer. So since the project was mooted for the, for the, uh, at the absolute outset um, many cycles ago, there was kind of confusion um, about the mission of the project and the extent to which it was limited to just doing metering in the sense of capturing data about the usage of user visible cloud resources and then um, generally feeding these data into consumers such as billing engines or whether it had kind of a, a wider um, scope to its mission and included uh, measurements of all kind, including um, monitoring, for example. So after many kind of debates around this, and um, some of them circular, and it kind of ebbed and flowed over multiple cycles, we finally come to the point where we've um, tied down an explicit, an explicit mission statement and agreed that with the technical committee which are the, I suppose, the, uh, the main kind of um, steering group and from a technical oversight point of view in, in the OpenStack community. And we've wordsmithed a agreed um, mission statement. And I copied it into this slide here and um, put a bit of emphasis on some key words. And this is like literally hot off the presses from the governance repo. It um, was a patch that I had kind of on an extended review um, over many weeks and it, it landed a couple of weeks ago. So um, this basically represents the, um, the state of the art as far as the definition of the Salometer project is concerned. So basically what we're talking about is a mission to reliably collect measurements. Right? So um, reliability is key there, and we've reflected that um, in the mission statement. And the idea is to basically collect measurements around both the usage of cloud resources, and this is the, the type of information that could potentially feed, um, say, for example, a billing engine, but also the performance of those resources. So you can imagine if you tie it down to, say, um, an instance, uh, an actual virtual machine in an OpenStack cloud, the uh, usage of the resource would relate to how long the, the instance is actually running for, when it was um, booted up, how long it ran for, what uh, flavor it had, and so on, and um, when, it, when it actually stopped to, uh, existing and, and was, was terminated. Whereas the um, performance aspects of it would include thing, things like, well, how much memory was it using at a particular point in time? Or what was the CPU utilization percentage um, at, at another moment in time? So our mission is to reliably collect both types of, infra of, of um, utilization data as they relate to virtual resources. So these will be things like um, instances, as I just mentioned, or images in, in Glance, or uh, volumes of block storage, for example, in Cinder, and also to, to physical resources that map directly onto the fabric of the data center. So we're talking about um, host-level information, for example, say the CPU load averages over an entire host as opposed to um, just the utilization associated with a, an individual instance. And to gather all of that data, right, so that's our first thing, and basically to slurp it all in um, via a pipeline such that these data are persisted, so that they're stored reliably in some kind of um, storage engine. And we've got a variety of pluggable storage engines in Telometer ranging from um, no SQL um, data stores such as MongoDB, which is probably our canonical storage driver, and it's the one that, that most um, distributions, OpenStack distributions, would actually support for use in production. But we've also got um, storage drivers, for example, based on HBase and DB2, and we also have a, even a SQL Alchemy storage driver that's more suited to kind of small deployments or, or proofs of concept. And the idea that is that once these data are persisted in the metering store, they become available for later retrieval. And that retrieval is affected via a RESTful API as per the, um, the uh, common practice in OpenStack. And then the analytics provided via that API are at a relatively simple level. So the idea is that Salometer itself is not in the business of providing complex analytics. And we do provide you know, basic aggregate functions and you know, uh, average, standard deviation, uh, minimum, maximum, that kind of thing. 
but um, more complex um, uh, analytics are assumed to occur outside of the scope of Cellometer and, and be applied to the data retrieved via our public API. And then the, the last kind of um, clause of this mission statement relates to the Cellometer alarming feature. And the idea here is that we have the ability to do um, to watch trends in certain statistics and to trigger basic actions, such as calling out the web hooks when some defined criteria are met, which is usually expressed in terms of a threshold for a particular statistic over a particular time window having been crossed. And this is the aspect of Cellometer that's used in conjunction with heat to drive auto-scaling actions. This is basically the mechanism that allows you to define a set of instances as an auto-scaling group. And these would be defined in your heat template. So heat is the orchestration engine in OpenStack. And to basically associate high and low watermarks in terms of the busyness of those instances. For example, to say, if the average instance across my auto-scaling group is running relatively hot, as in the average CPU utilization exceeds, say, 70%, well, then we want to share the load a bit wider. So we want to spin up more instances and have that happen in, a, in an automated fashion. And conversely, we may have a low watermark where you say, well, if the, if the average instance is kind of running, running idle at this point in time, it's, a, it's an indication that we're overscaled. So we want to basically shut down some of the instances that, that, that make up our auto-scaling group and share the load or concentrate the load over, over a, 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 um, a narrower group of, of uh, horizontally scaled out um, web servers or mail servers or database servers or whatever your, your instance happens to be hosting. So that's fairly, a fairly wide kind of uh, range of things that Cellometer does. Um, and hopefully the fact that we've agreed now this mission statement with the um, technical committee and basically it, it's all, all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed as far as the governance repo is concerned, um, that, that that will kind of put to, to bed the debate around the, the, the scope of Cellometer and whether you know, any particular new feature is, you know, could be characterized as mission creep or whether it falls within, within the, the, um, the well understood scope of this project. So that's, um, that's slide two. Moving on to slide three, and I've just kind of set the scene, I guess, there with um, talking about our mission statement. So I think it would be worth talking a little bit about where we are if we were to, to take the, the current state of play. Um, what, how would you define the health of the project um, at the end, of, outset of, say, the Juno development cycle? Well, as luck would have it, we had a very useful and healthy checkpoint recently in the form of a technical community gap analysis. So moving on to slide four, let me um, explain what the background to this was first. So Heat and Cellometer actually graduated at or about the same time, right before the outset of the Havana development cycle. So that was a couple of cycles back in time. And at that point, we were the first projects outside of the traditional group of five or six that formed the original core of OpenStack. So in a sense, the rules were being kind of just being defined um, at the point in time at which Heat and Cellometer graduated. And as time has progressed, more and more projects have appeared in the, in the OpenStack ecosystem. And there's been quite an explosion of activity, I guess. And the, the kind of the, 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 the standards and the rules applied as far as um, graduating from an incubating project to an integrated project have become more and more defined. There's been kind of a, a gradual inflation, I guess, in terms of the standards required and a raising of the bar, which I think is a healthy thing. But in fairness, it also meant that the projects that graduated first got you know, a, 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 an easier ride, as it were. So the technical committee, in the interest of fairness, decided to do a retrospective gap analysis on all of the existing integrated projects and decide whether those projects met the new higher bar that is, being, that is currently being applied to projects that have requested integrated status in more recent times. That would be projects such as, say, Designate, the um, DNS as a service, service um, or Marconi, the, the queuing service, to, to take two um, relatively recent examples. So I think this is a very healthy thing, and it, it provides a very kind of useful checkpoint as to where Cellometer was and where it's at now and you know, whether it, it meets that higher bar. 
So the outcome of that gap analysis were that a number of concerns were, were identified, a number of gaps were, were, um, were identified by the technical committee. And this has been the pattern when these gap analyses have been applied to each of the projects in turn. And then the idea is that basically the projects um, commit to resolving these, um, these gaps, resolving these concerns in pretty short order. So we submitted with the technical committee to show front-loaded progress on, on these gaps and within the scope of the Juno 1 milestone, which is just passed, and the Juno and completing this work um, for Juno 2, which is due in late July. I think it's July 24th. So in addition to the mission statement that I mentioned earlier, the actual gaps identified, I've listed them out here. One of them was to have a viable SQL Alchemy driver. This is the storage engine for Salometer that stores the metering data in um, a, a relational database and accessed using the um, SQL Alchemy library, which is a Python and an object relational mapping toolkit. And to, we had a, a SQL Alchemy driver, but it suffered from some performance issues. Um, it was essentially there as kind of an alternative to Mongo, but most of our um, development effort had gone historically into MongoDB. And that was the most featureful, um, most widely used, and certainly had, and by far, the, the, the most superior performance characteristics. Um, of, of any of our storage driver. So the SQL Alchemy one was kind of the poor cousin, um, and its usage within the continuous integration gate um, had, had introduced some issues. Now, I suppose we should kind of preface all remarks associated with SQL Alchemy driver with a caveat that it's not really recommended for production use on any kind of large scale, because relational databases are not really well suited to storing metric data. You know, that's just kind of a fact of life. But it's something that's useful to have um, for running in situations where Mongo is not available, which would be the case um, in the continuous integration gate, because the version of Ubuntu on which most of our continuous integration uh, runs, that's 12.04, Ubuntu Precise, had only a, a, an older version of Mongo that didn't meet our Salometer's requirements. So basically, we've, we've done a lot of work on um, improving the performance of the SQL Alchemy driver such that and it now is uh, acceptable um, as a viable um, citizen within the continuous integration gate, and it's you know, suitable for relatively small proofs of concept and, and small deployments if people, if people wish to use it. And that's been quite an interesting technical exercise because it's involved quite a lot of close interaction with the author of SQL Alchemy, um, a guy called Mike Baer, a colleague of mine in Red Hat. And uh, yeah, I think we, 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 we brought that from a state where its performance was unacceptable to uh, a much healthier state within the, the scope of the Juno 1 timeframe. Now, a very related thing was Tempest. So Tempest is an integration test framework within OpenStack. And this is basically where we, obviously we do unit tests per project, but we also want to be capable of testing things um, with various services used together and everything spun up in a realistic way instead of external dependencies being mocked out. And Tempest basically is the harness that gives us that capability. Now, with a lot of Tempest coverage for Salometer that was written during the previous release cycle, the ICES release cycle, but we didn't um, have the capability to actually switch that on within the gate because of the performance issues with the, um, with the SQL Alchemy driver. Now that those have been resolved, We've landed a, a wider variety of um, Tempest test coverage, and we've also utilized our own capabilities API, which allows branchless Tempest to run against both the latest on Juno and also the um, stable ISAS branch, which um, wouldn't have all of the performance um, improvements to SQL Alchemy. And the Tempest test is capable of um, dynamically discovering whether or not the uh, version of Salometer that's been tested basically has the performance characteristics that involve, that allow various test scenarios to be unskipped. So that's all kind of very neat and, and is working well. We also want to enable testing um, against MongoDB because, uh, in the integration test because um, clearly that's our, our preferred um, and most widely supported and widely used um, storage driver. And this will probably involve us um, either taking advantage of the continuous integration switch over to Ubuntu Trusty or else using Fedora 20 um, and or CentOS 7 in the gate to allow us to access the, the more up-to-date version of Mongo that Salometer requires. The third item there in the list relates to documentation. So we have quite a lot of developer-oriented documentation, which would describe things like, how do you spin up a dev stack and run this thing in a sense of 
a code contributor might view it, but we didn't have as much um, interpretation that related to um, you know, the point of view of a typical user or even a typical operator. So we're definitely addressing that in conjunction with the documentation team. One thing we've done is we've taken a kind of getting started guide that I wrote for the RDO website, and we're taking that and basically recasting it in, in a kind of a, a distribution agnostic form. And we're also writing a, a new operator oriented guide. And lastly, we've got the grenade upgrade testing harness. So this is another part of the um, quality assurance um, pipeline within the OpenStack community, which is uh, very useful, which basically uh, involves testing the resilience of various services across upgrades. And it's interesting because it is the type of thing that in the early days of OpenStack, problems were really only discovered in the field. When people actually tried to upgrade from um, you know, release A to release B, um, uh, problems that might have been unanticipated or not uh, encountered in testing um, occurred in production, which obviously um, was badness. So the Grenade testing framework is a very simple idea. It just installs the old version of OpenStack, spins up some resources, shuts down the old, leaves the resources running, and moves, rolls forward to the, to the newer version of OpenStack, reruns all of the services, and then does various assertions around the survivability of those resources. So individual projects can then participate in Grenade by adding their own specific assertions. So in Salometer's case, it would be, for example, that a statistics query, which spans the old cloud via the upgrade downtime into the new cloud, that basically such a, such a query returns valid data, and you know, a mixture of the, the new and the old metric data is valid and doesn't cause things to explode, and everything is good in that sense. So they're basically the um, actions that we've been mandated by the technical committee. Moving on to slide five, though, let's get into the kind of the meatier, more interesting stuff. So a lot of that and those mandated actions from the TC were around kind of being a good citizen within the continuous integration framework or providing documentation, those kind of uh, good citizenry type um, requirements. But um, probably of more interest to a lot of people on the call would be what's coming up in terms of features. Okay, so moving on to slide six. Um, I guess the way I'm viewing it as PTL is we've a strategy over the Juno cycle to basically have two parallel efforts in play, one of which has got a kind of a longer time horizon. It's kind of a multi-cycle effort. And it's around kind of paying down the architectural debt that we've, um, that we've kind of accreted over time and basically changing the nature of our metering store. Then the, the second parallel um, effort is more got a shorter time horizon, and it's, it's more featured on incremental improvements to what we already have, addition of new features that are specific interest to um, a lot of current users, and general improvements of, of where we are now. So let's talk about the, the, the more kind of uh, the longer time horizon, the more forward-looking thing. So this is something we spent a lot of our time in Atlanta at Summit discussing. Um, and this is basically the idea of reimagining Solometer as more of a time series data as a service service, right? as opposed to a service that stores data which mixes in actual um, metric data points with snapshots of resource metadata. So if you were, for example, to take um, the current metering store in um, Solometer, for example, at a installation that was based on MongoDB, and you were to fire up the Mongo client and, and have a look at what's in our meters collection you would see that for every data point that we store, we'll say the CPU utilization of a particular instance is 42 at this moment in time, and then a minute later it's 43, and then two minutes later it's 41, whatever. So that's a trend in, certain, in terms of some numerical value. But associated with each of those data points, we also store a snapshot of the resource metadata. Now this gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of allowing us to query in and slice and dice these data in, in a lot of novel different ways, right? But it also means that our metering store is quite heavyweight and is, is, is um, not as efficient as it could be in terms of um, either space or time because these met metering or these uh, snapshots of the resource metadata are, are quite kind of beefy things. And most of these data actually don't change very much. They're either completely static or infrequently changing. So for example, the flavor of a resource, or flavor of an instance rather, 
might only change when you resize that instance, which is a relatively infrequent event that may not even occur for the lifetimes of, of many, many um, practical instances. So what we're um, doing with, with time series data as a service is we're splitting off the resource representation from the pure metric data points. And then we're using the ability to persist individual events, which are basically notifications of some life cycle change in the history or the lifetime of a resource, to basically reconstruct the resource state timeline if necessary. But in terms of um, the actual trend recording, what we want to do is store these data in a much more lightweight way, and shorn of the uh, more heavyweight resource metadata snapshots. And that allows us a lot of flexibility as to how we store these data and a lot more efficiency in terms of the uh, storage footprint and the, um, the, the, the kind of time characteristics of querying and so on. So we've a prototype implementation of this in Stackforge. We've spun up a new project on Stackforge called Naki. Just kind of, if you look at the code, you'll see there's kind of an Italian food theme pervading through it. And that's been driven by Julien Donjou, who's my um, predecessor as PTL of Solometer, who served as, as, as PTL for two cycles. And the idea here is that it'll contain a canonical um, storage driver and an analytics engine that's based on the popular uh, Pandas library in Python and Swift as um, providing the actual storage. And then we will also have the capability to plug in um, alternative storage drivers. And the idea here is that we will build integrations with state-of-the-art in terms of metric-oriented databases. For example, we've got a, a good conversation going at the moment with the folks behind InfluxDB, which is a, a relatively new metrics-oriented database uh, implemented in the Go programming language. That's very interesting. We're going to have the main uh, contributor to that coming to our mid-cycle in Paris next week. And um, we also are looking at some other metrics-oriented databases like um, OpenTSDB. But we'll also have our kind of canonical um, driver that has no external dependencies um, in terms of external services, and that will be based on Pandas and Swift. And the idea here is that we'll develop this over multiple um, development cycles. We'll have kind of a prototype implementation um, ready uh, by the end of Juno. And basically, this will form the basis of the next major iteration of the Salometer API, which will be the V3 API. But for now, the V2 API is where it's at. That's what we're supporting. And there'll be a long period and a long deprecation path, as is usual in OpenStack of multiple cycles. So there's no need to be concerned that the, um, the current API is going away or anything of that ilk. So that's the kind of forward-looking stuff. The more um, immediate um, goals involve incremental improvements, various features that are widely requested and much desired, and are kind of of particular interest to individual contributors in the Solometer community. So just jumping through these, um, one is the over the ICAS cycle, which was the previous development cycle in, in OpenStack, we added the ability to do SNMP monitoring of host metrics. So for example, you can acquire things like the CPU load averages at a host level. Now the way SNMP is actually structured is, there's a bunch of different metrics, each identified by an OID, um, that basically could be gathered. And every installation really, I guess, has to choose which particular metrics it's interested in. Currently, the, the, uh, the way it's implemented in Solometer is for each new metric, each new OID that we're interested in, in uh, at an SNMP level, we have to write a bit of Python code to basically grab that value and massage it and distill it and produce a sample and that's then submitted to the, to the metering store. So the idea is to do this in a much more declarative fashion. It's completely driven by config and doesn't require any new code. So you can think of it as code-free metering. And it allows basically people to just pick and choose from a menu, menu of options. Um, for example, these could be SNMP OIDs, or it could be uh, metrics that are available via some other source, say, for example, via the, the vSphere API, if you're using VMware. And you, in a completely declarative fashion, code-free, no need to write any new polling code, basically enable the metering and define the mapping from this particular external metric to the native Solometer representation of that, of that sample. Uh, another interesting feature that we're adding is event storage. So basically, we have this implemented in our SQL Alchemy driver already, and this was contributed by some of the folks behind the StackTac framework. And basically, what we wanted to do is extend that so that the same functionality is supported in a variety of different storage drivers, in particular HBase and MongoDB. 
And what we intend to use these um, events for is basically these are notifications that tell us that something significant has happened in the life cycle of a resource. For example, an attempt to migrate an instance has started or an instance resize is finished. Um, and these basically allow us to reconstruct the timeline of the resource state um, after the fact without necessarily relying on continual snapshotting of the resource metadata as we did previously. Uh, another kind of technical debt that we, um, that we need to pay down is around the um, scalability of the central agent. So the central agent basically is a component of Solometer that does things like drive the SNMP polling. It also allows us to um, retrieve data from public RESTful APIs exposed by the various services. But the thing is that the way the central agent was originally written, there was no way of doing a load sharing. There was no way of starting up two instances of the central agent and saying to one, okay, you take care of this, and the other one, you take care of that, and basically allocating a disjoint load to, uh, to each of them so they didn't kind of duplicate their efforts and step on each other's toes. So the result is basically the central agent is kind of like a single point of failure. I mean, you can do it. You can run a multiple search for central agents in kind of active passive mode, but you can't scale it out in active active mode, which is the way you want to do it generally. So what we're intending to do is to use the task flow library, which is widely used in OpenStack, and to use this as kind of a, a work partitioning um, engine to allow us to start up multiple central agents and for them to share the load between them and coordinate their efforts. Um, another interesting feature is around IPMI sensor data. So IPMI uh, provides the capability to get a lot of fairly low-level data, things like very hardware-oriented, things like temperatures and fan speeds and voltages and all that kind of hardware-y stuff, um, which is all goodness and of interest sometimes. Um, but the thing is about IPMI, well, there's two issues with Solometer uh, invoking on it directly. Number one, there's a credentialing issue. So generally, IPMI uh, is username and password. And we don't want to leak these credentials into um, Solometer. And we didn't really want to take a dependency on something like Barbican yet, because um, it's kind of a bit early in, in that project's life cycle. So Ironic already has the capability to own these credentials. Then there's also the issue that over-polling of IPMI as an over-frequent polling can cause issues. I mean, there are known issues around um, lockup being caused by just calling out to IPMI uh, with too tight a polling cycle. So it seemed logical for Ironic to remain the owner of both the credentials protecting the IPMI interface and also um, to control the cadence or the frequency of that polling interval. So the way we agreed with the Ironic folks at, at the summit just gone is that they will control the polling cycle, and they'll emit an AMQ key notification containing a dump of the sensor data from IPMI. And then Solometer will take that, massage it, filter it, take the data that's kind of varying and interesting, and, and according to our configuration for a particular deployment, persist some of these data in the form of Solometer meters. And then the last thing I mentioned there in terms of our incremental improvements is a variety of um, integrations with the um, networking services provided by Neutron. So for Juno 1, we've already got the capability to acquire statistics related to load balancing as a service. So you can kind of see how many connections are open at a particular time, and you know, what the state of the health probes are, that kind of thing. But going forward through Juno, um, we've got a contributor from Cisco who's very interested in extending this to do similar things for the firewall as a service and the uh, virtual private network as a service and all of the other star and AAS is provided by Neutron so as to provide a more complete um, view of what's going on. So um, basically, yeah, so that's the incremental improvements. So yeah, moving on to slide nine, I guess that's, that's kind of it as far as what I wanted to talk about today. So um, I guess thank you for your attention, folks. Um, and I suppose we may have a couple of minutes for questions. I think I've probably gone over time. There's a tendency to do that when I get into the zone. But um, I'll hand it back to, to Margie at this point. Great. Thank you, Owen. Quite all right. That's wonderful. Um, let's see. Let me get back over to the portal. Does anyone have any questions they want to ask today? I know we have some people on the line. Do you want to? I actually did not mute the line, so you can go ahead and ask them out loud, or you could put them in the chat box. Or you could not ask any. That's okay. Uh, sometimes people ask questions after the webinar uh, when the meeting burner 
meeting is complete, uh, you'll get, uh, I think, a survey or something, and you can send those questions back over to us too. So that works fine as well. So anyone else? Questions? Okay. Well, Owen, thank you very much. John, thank you very much for your time. I know you're both very busy. Uh, for those on the call, uh, this recording will be on YouTube probably by the end of the week, early next, along with the rest of the PTL webinar series that will complete, I think, mid-next week before um, the July 4th holiday here in the States. And with that, I will end the webinar. And thanks again uh, to John and Owen, and have a great day. Thanks, Thank all. you. Bye-bye.